Jeremiah chapter 13. And we have here is the girdle. And I'm just trying to look at something here real quick. We come up to the 13th chapter of rebellion. Jeremiah has 52 chapters. Same amount, amount of cards in a, in a standard deck of cards. We are at one quarter done of Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord unto me, Jeremiah, go and get thee a linen girdle, a good girdle, a nice girdle. Now it says linen, it doesn't say fine linen. And yet fine linen is the righteousness of the saints in Revelation. Says a linen girdle. That's what the priest wore. That's what Jeremiah is. He's a Levite. Though we have not checked to think about to think about it right now. I don't know if Jeremiah is a Levite Levite or he's actually of the seed of Abraham. Uh, uh, excuse me, Aaron. Because all priests were Levites. Of the children of Aaron's family. But not all Levites were priests. There were four families. Looking into the Levites and the priesthood. And one. The, the, the family of the actual priests were of Aaron. And his sons. And uh, I couldn't even think about the other names. Of the children of Levi. Go get thee a linen girl. And put it upon thy loins. So get you a linen girl and wear it. So it shows you where your loins are. Where your girdle. So you, you got people today. Thou shalt not wear what pertains to a woman. And a, and a woman is not to wear what pertains to a man. Then what is Jeremiah doing wearing a girdle? Why was Saul wearing a skirt? And if you've studied history and the uniform of dress, I wouldn't call any Celtic people I wouldn't call any of the people that wore kelps. I wouldn't dare walk up in their face and say, you're a sissy. They kick you and kill you and get you down. You know, and they, they forget about, you know, and, and they, they run to the law for what they like and they run for the law what they don't like. I mean, for a woman to pertain to a man and a man would pertain to a woman's far as clothing, that's under the law. We're not under the law. But you run to the law. So I put it, he said, put it upon the loins and put it not in water. Don't watch it. So I got me a girdle according to the word of the Lord and put it on my loin. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time saying. Now we don't know how long he's been wearing this girdle. We don't know how long he hasn't been watching this girdle. And we don't know how long the second time is. Take the girdle that thou hast got. Which is upon thy loins. He's still wearing it. And what God's doing is, is what he does weird with... Uh, of his prophets is he uses them for an illustration and sometimes the illustrations are weird Isaiah is told to go barefoot and naked and then there, there's scholars well you know he had kind of clothing and Peter wasn't naked and yet the Bible says Adam and Eve were naked and they, and they were not ashamed he tells Ezekiel Ezekiel I want you to get some little army men and I want you to get a cast iron pot. And I want you to play a little army man. And I want to use that for an illustration 
of Judah. So this is one of the things that's common for God, and Jews require a sign. Jeremiah is a Jew, and this is a sign. Arise and go to the Euphrates and hide it there in a hole of a rock. Now let me break up my, this is the problem, I got a new Bible. Jeremiah 13, let me check here real quick, I got a note here. I got me a new Bible, this Bible is just stuck in gooey. I don't know what happened to this one. Jeremiah 13. I got a distance of 300 miles. Three hundred to five hundred miles to Babylon. Three hundred to five hundred miles. <laughs> That's a trip. I'm gonna write that down real quick. Three hundred to five hundred miles. <clears throat> That's without a car. That's without a plane. That's without a train, without a bicycle. So I went and hid it in the Euphrates. That's all the way up by Iran. That's where Babylon is. This is where Judah is going to go. Jeremiah is going where Judah is going to go. As the Lord commanded me. He does exactly what God tells him to do. And it came to pass after many days that the Lord said unto me, I mean, look at this whole chapter about a girdle. Arise and go to Euphrates. Take the girdle fence, which I command thee to hide there. All right, so take this girdle brand new. Wear it. Don't watch it. And forever how long he's wearing it and he doesn't take it off. Now God take, tells him, go all the way up to the Euphrates River Take that girdle off and hide it in the river, along the along the bank of the river. And he tells him to go back. He's going now from six hundred to a thousand miles for this illustration. I went to the Euphrates and dig. It's been it's been covered in soil. It's been covered in the sand in the in from the rushings of the water. I took the girdle from the place where I had hit it. And behold, the girdle was marred. It was profitable for nothing. I mean, that's not something that you're going to be able to put in, a, in their washing. They didn't have wash machines. They didn't have dry cleaners. They would take it to the river and they would beat it up against a rock and they would use the, the wash pan. Okay, so it's not going to get professionally done clean. He couldn't run to the store and get a chemical detergent. And he's sure not going to sell it. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Thus saith the Lord, after this manner, I... After this man will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. All right, so what we have here, we have a linen girdle, not a fine linen. We have a linen girdle. And that linen girdle pitches now the pride. It's pride. Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, but this linen girdle, it's pride, God says. I, he says, will I mar the pride of Jesus? What has been marred? The girdle that is in uh, uh, Jeremiah's hand. That girdle represents the pride of Judah. It's been stained. That's the pride. Linen, fine linen is righteousness of the same. But when you add your pride, and I have seen pride with Christians, I have seen pride with pastors, and I have seen pride with the church. 
And what you do is you're taking your fine linen and you're marring it. And what you're going to do, what Judah is going to do, what Jeremiah is going to do, you're going to walk up to God, the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to say, let me see your underwear. My underwear. Bear the linen girdle. And your pride. And Christians all got pride. Somewhere along the line, I mean, self and all that ego. Ego. Can't say ego. I have heard pastors say, I am proud of my congregation. I am proud of my children. I, that's a sin. Nowhere in the Bible is pride ever spoken of properly. And the great pride of Jerusalem. So you can take something as linen, as fine as, as it is for, for the children of God, and you can mar it. Listen, no one at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be perfect. No one, except for Jesus Christ. And there are going to be some Christians that are going to walk away with, with a galore of pleasing God. Well done. That's what God says. He doesn't say, I'm proud of you. He says, well done. They're going to have crowns, and they're going to get lands, and they're going to get inheritance. That pleases the Lord. And you're going to get a spectrum, let's say that's 10, on a scale of 1 to 10. I mean, they're just loaded with crowns. Paul, Peter, and them are going to get loaded with crowns. And in matter of fact, they, they get seats. Of Jesus Christ in, in the in the city in the land of Israel. And then you're going to have Christians on the one or zero side of the spectrum, and they're going to have nothing. When the fire comes, it's going to be all ashes and nothing, and they're going to be there stark naked before all the congregations of all the church and Jesus Christ. Listen, if Jesus Christ hung on that cross naked and the, and the men and women are going to be at the great white throne judgment with no clothing, what do you think you're going to be? When you've done nothing and you marred this evil people which refuse to hear my words and be 13 chapters of it, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle. All right, there's a representation of that girl. It has been marred by pride. It has been marred by the imaginations of the heart. It has been marred by serving and worshiping other gods, which is good for nothing. And that's where the expression of the Bible comes from. I mean, out of the world. When someone says it's good for nothing, they stole it from a King James Bible. Imagine somebody, oh, I've got the NIV. I, I, I've got the, the modern Bible. I don't believe in the Bible. The Bible's written by men. And they come, oh, that's good for nothing. <laughs> yeah. What are you laughing at? Never mind. I wonder if that's messed up in, that good for nothing is messed up in the modern Bible. I wonder. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, sticks to the loins, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel. The girdle itself, the, the, the linen, pictures the nation of Israel. The whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be a, unto me a people for a name, for praise and for glory, but they would not hear. God says that girdle, when you first got that girdle, that represents Israel. And when you didn't wash it and sweat and, and, and other things that got on that girdle from you wearing it, and then you hiding it in the Euphrates River, 
That's Israel in pride. That's Israel in not listening to me. That's Israel serving and worshiping other gods. And that's Israel serving the imaginations of their heart. And if that were be a representation today of the Christian, and thank God I don't need a wash machine, I don't need a dry cleaner, I need the blood of Jesus Christ, and the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse me from all unrighteousness and all sin, that that girdle can be held up to God and is sparkingly clean. And if that were to be applied to the Christian, that girdle would not affect me because I've been cut away. It's almost like, all right, here I sit in the chair and my girdle's sitting over here. Soil. I'm not wearing it. It may be soiled, but I'm not wearing it. That, 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 no sin. All right, that's on the girdle. You can bury that girdle in the, in the dirt, in the grave. That's not me. But when God calls, okay, when God calls up the file cabinet, and I, I, listen, I, I'm applying this to the Christian. I'm applying Jeremiah to the Christian in America and the world today. And, and God would say, and, and it won't be a girdle, but our word, and God says, okay, show your girdle. What's it going to look like? What are you? What's the girdle going to look like? You got Christians who don't confess their sins. Or occasionally confess their sins. Or a lot of the time confess their sins. Or all the time confessing their sins. Listen, I don't care how deep the stain of the sin gets in. If you confess it, he is able to, to, to forgive and to cleanse. He changed that girdle to, that, that, that girdle to a fine linen. Righteousness. I mean, I hate to say it, there was there was a joke that you know, mom would always tell, make sure you got clean underwear. In case you got in that, you know, when you got to the, if you go end up going to the hospital, you know, uh, you know, you want to have clean underwear. That was the standard saying. Well, I thought an accident was, I'm not going to have clean underwear. They got a cleaning agent called Shout. It gets rid of certain stains. Now, I got the blood of Jesus Christ. That gets rid of all stains. I can take my girdle. I can take what, 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 an, an illustration of this for the Christian. I can take my girdle and I can wash that girdle in the blood of Jesus Christ. And it'd be like taking that girdle freshly out of a brand new package. In the blood of Jesus Christ, you can take that girdle and, and go to the store and buy a brand new girdle and you, you wouldn't even know the difference. Except for one thing. And they do this in the military. They mark your underwear. So they know who, they put your name and your ID on the underwear. And when you pull out the girdle and say, it belongs to God. That's mine. That soul is mine. That is my son. We can be cleansed. So the girdle represents the children of Israel, the children of Judah. The stains, can I say, represent the sins. And with Jeremiah wearing that, wearing that girdle, it's not going to. Some of those stains are not going to smell too good. And then some of the stains of I don't know how bad the Euphrates River is, but let me tell you, I come from New London, Connecticut. If you were to take in that girdle and you would hide that in the mud of the Thames River, and I can I can picture a couple good spots. You hide that thing in the, in the Thames River, and I don't know how long he the girl, and you go back and dig that thing up, you're not gonna want to smell that underwear. And I'm telling you, I, I, I've been involved in lobstering, lobster men. And we pull those pots up from the, from the, the muck. <laughs> We're going to talk about muck in Jeremiah soon. 
Uh, you want to talk about muck. All the industries in New London County and Norwich all over the years and the industries that are there now, that river bottom of the Thames River is muck. And it stinks. And then they wonder why the lobsters are dying in the fish. And you look at this, did not Isaiah talk about filthy rags? Therefore, thou shalt speak unto them thus word. Knows a lot about the girdle and a lot about the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Every, every, I mean every, mark my Bible again, every bottle shall be filled with wine. I think we've taken a new subject here. They shall say unto thee, I, I, here's the God, God says, Jeremiah, I want you to go talk to the people. All right, what do you want me to say, Lord? All right, this is what I want you to say. Every bottle shall be filled with wine. That's the message. They, Judah, will say, Do we not certainly know that every body, bottle shall be filled with wine? This is not one of them weird... All right, everybody, come here. All the bottles are going to be filled with wine. Jeremiah, what? All the bottles, we certainly know all the bottles are filled with wine. Man, your average American would love that. Then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will fill all the inhabitants of the land, land of Israel, all, Gentile and Jews. That's all. Even the king that sits upon David's throne, all right, royalty. And the priest, the ones at the temple. Again, I, I'll have to check if I remember. I don't know if Jeremiah is of Aaron's man, but these are Aaron's sons. Great, 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 great grandsons. The priests. It can also be not only the Levitical, Levitical priest, it can also be the false priest. Because remember, Jeremiah told us through God that every street there's a church, in every city there's an altar. And all those fallen, fallen worship altars of false gods, there are priests offering up. And the prophets. And all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with drunkenness. I don't think those prophets are God's prophets. The priests were forbidden to drink wine while they were on duty. It is forbidden under the law. We're under the law. But God says, every bottle shall be filled with wine. And the, and the kings and the, I would say, the Levitical priests and the false priests and the false prophets. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, because you don't see Ezekiel getting drunk. You don't see Jeremiah getting drunk. You don't see Beirut getting drunk. And all the people are going to be in drunkenness. So one of the great fallen aspects of the judgment of God upon a nation is the great desire everybody's getting drunk. Even people who are not supposed to get drunk. And I will, well, there's a will, da dash them one against another. <laughs> 
with the drunkenness. Even the fathers and the sons together, God's going to death. You can't defend yourself. You cannot fight. You're not of a great defense when you're intoxicated. Say it the Lord. God said it. It's going to be so. I will not pity, not spare, not have mercy, but destroy them. This is God's people. This is God speaking. Because the anger of God, of his holiness and his righteousness and him being as judge and the sins of the people. Get that stinking girdle out of my holy presence. Jeremiah said, our righteousness as filthy rags. You're not going to see this filth in glory. You're not going to have stains on your fine linen ever again. Hear ye. And give ear. Better listen. Be not proud. How more can you explain it? And there are people out there. We've got the greatest church. Now I will say. Hey I heard a great message today. Or that message that was given last week. I heard a preacher preach a good or great message the other day. Now, I'm not going to give the man the credit of being great. Because I know he's me, human. And we all sin. And I will give the message which came from the Holy Spirit. Hey, that was a great message that, that the Holy Spirit, that God used that man to deliver. The man, the church, and all, they're not great. I'm not great. Give glory to the Lord your God. So in pride and being proud, you don't give glory to God. Before he causes darkness. Before your feet stumble upon the dark mountain. And that's one of the stories in Pilgrim's Progress. And it wasn't dark mountains. I remember the fact that uh, they became blind or their eyes were, were, were taken up and just wandered. And no aim. Aimless. Until they just died. And no one ever heard of them. Like Demas, I uh, heard today in church, he forsook the Lord and went back to the Thessalonica and Paul died. Did Demas ever get right? We don't know. Because it was Paul's last letter. Now listen, I want to tell you something about Demas. If you're going to backslide, Thessalonica would be the last place to run. Because Thessalonica loved the Lord, served the Lord, and they were being persecuted for their faith. That was the wrong place. I would assume that Demas went back to Thessalonica, and I would assume, assume by the conduct of Thessalonica, if he stayed in Thessalonica, he didn't stay back long. long. Or he really fought the Spirit. Or which Paul died, we were never found out. He moved elsewhere. I mean, there's one other place, I can't think of the place right now, where they actually search the scriptures and study the scriptures. That would be another bad place for backsliding. And while ye look for light, he turneth into shadow of death, comes death. 
and make it gross darkness. Man, that would be the story of the consecration camps. I can't imagine the horrors of the darkness of the Jews being loaded up into railway cars and then being loaded up into buildings where they would be burned to death. But if ye will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. My eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock, Israel, is carried away captive. <laughs> uh, that's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. And Jeremiah is going to witness that. He'll be in prison and then released. Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, repent, sit down, for your principalities shall come down. Oh, look at that word. Look at that word. Principalities in high places, speaking about the devil. And his devils shall come down, even the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it, and it will. It shall be wholly carried away captive, and it does. Jeremiah will, will record it. And in Jeremiah and in Leviticus. I'm not Leviticus. Uh, due to, uh, Lamentations. Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from the north, Babylon, where Jeremiah took the girdle. You know, the girdle was soiled before it got to Babylon and it became more soiled in Babylon. You know, by the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah is just angry with a particular sin of the Jews. They have married Babylonians and they had had Gentile children. They have left the heritage of their being born of Jacob, the tribes of Israel, 12 of them. They have left their heritage of Benjamin marrying Benjamin, Dan marrying Dan, Judah marrying Judah, Levi marrying Levi. They are married Babylonians and a list of names is found in Nehemiah and some of them are the priests. Some of them are the Levites. How come in the whole nation of the authority of Nebuchadnezzar are you telling me on that fine afternoon there was only three Jews that stood up before the golden image of, of Nebuchadnezzar? You mean there were no other Jews there? Why weren't there other Jews standing up? Same question. Why don't you have Christians out there witnessing? Why don't you have Christians proclaiming the gospel and not the nonsense? Why is it that here we are in Daytona Beach, Florida, and we get a lot of visitors from all over the world. And we'll get somebody from, from America. And they'll come up to us like. And, and they love the Lord. And they say like. We have never seen some of what you guys do here. Wow. And I've had a couple of things. When, when I get home to my home church. I'm talking to my pastor. I won't try to get something out like this. I mean you're over here preaching. And your daughter's over there passing out gospel tracts. 
Wow. And we were talking about in Sunday school today, the things with the kids and all. And Christians need to stand up. Where were the Christians in Roe versus Way? Where was the Christians in the monkey scopes trial? You know, they sat down, well, I don't want to disturb anybody. I, I don't want to let my light shine, but I shouldn't say anything. And look at the garbage and look at the mess by not standing up and the victory given to the devil at the Scopes monkey trial. And the victory given over to the devil and the death of babies in Roe versus Ray. Where were the Christians when they did All right, let's take the Bible and God out of the public school system. Where are they? And then you're going to turn around and say, oh, we have a great church. We have a great pastor. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let's Google your church. Okay. All right. I see the address here. Let's let's bring up Google Maps. Okay. This is, this is, located, this is the address of your church. All right. Google Maps. Let's bring up uh, a... Let's bring up the razor. All right, now, let's do a search. You're such a great church. You got such a great pastor, everything. Let's see how many bars, taverns, and places that sell liquor. I know a church. And you go to the church. You're on your way to the church, and you're on your way home from the church. And they got benches there. Psychic. And I guarantee somebody, the devil, put those psychic benches for park benches, the bus bench, right at church, just to say, oh, you're really a great church? How about the psychic? How about on Wednesday night you got a bar within walking distance of your church and you don't even affect them? Huh? It's so great? You got Paul that's in trouble with, with, with the silversmith over the great goddess Diana. And I got people in Daytona Beach that are upset with me, blaming me because of their income and their businesses are failing because I'm preaching the gospel. And there have been some businesses who have closed there because they're filthy mouths and all that. And I got people who really want to do it on. I got people who want to do an honest business, an honest job. They don't want to cheat their customer. You know, come on. Hey, you know, if anything of my products here, anything you like, it's yours. Hey, you know what, Stanley? I, I can't believe they call the cops on you. I can't believe that you come over here and, and sit by us. And if they don't want to hear you, me and my customers and my employees will hear you. You know? Lift up your eyes and behold them that come from afar north. Where is the flock that was given thee? Thy beautiful flock. They're gone. They're out of their land. Where's all the wonderful great churches? They closed their doors because of a disease. Though some have opened up their doors, some of their doors will never open up again. And some of those doors will close up again and not be open. Some of those doors, the churches, uh, we don't need to be, we don't need evangelism. We let our light shine. And the people in the congregation are going to grow old. They're going to die of old age. And the pastor is going to do a funeral. And it will be the last funeral in that church because the last church member died of old age. 
And you can't say with the church today, well, you know, we're bringing the younger generation. We're, they we're doing things worldly and all that. We're having fun and entertainment. And your church has just totally turned into chaos. And you skipped away from the Bible because that's not cool. And you may have had the old hymns, but you got to change the hymns because, you know, you got to have a drum major come in. And you haven't read Revelation chapter 3, the last seen church age. Where is the beautiful Judah? Name me names of Ezekiel who's in Babylon, of Daniel that's in Babylon, of Ezra and Nehemiah that left Babylon. Show me the names. Of all the Israelites that did good. I forget if it was Ezra or Nehemiah. I think it's Nehemiah. He's ready to go. Nehemiah. He said, all right, we got the camels, we got the horses, we got the... Where's the Levites? Go get the Levites. We're ready to go. Will you go get the Levites? They weren't ready to go. <laughs> you know, it was like Lot. Uh, I don't know what the angel's name was, but you, you want to grab him, and I'll grab the wife and the daughters. We got to get out of here. Will you turn off that TV set? Will you get that woman out of the kitchen? Tell the girls they're not going to the school prom. We got to get out of this city. You know, you, did you read what the angel said to Lot? We can't do nothing till you're out of here. Wait a minute. What, what's happened to beautiful? What, what happened to the girdle? It got soiled. You think Daniel got soiled? You think Shadrach, Meshach, and Luke? Listen, Daniel said, oh, praise me, look how great I am. And Daniel accepted worship by the king. Are you telling me that Daniel's not standing before Jehovah one day? He's not standing before the Lord Jesus Christ one day? And he's like, he'll be clean. He'll be clean one day. Jeremiah and uh, uh, Baruch and Moses. One day we'll all be and we'll all be clean. We all got so soiled underwear. I mean, if the church don't have a girdle, we've got soiled underwear. And if you wear your underwear day after day after that, you will have smelly underwear. Not under the blood of Jesus Christ. What? Wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? What are you going to say when God brings the army? Well, what's their, been their attitude? God ain't going to do it. Everything's hunky-dory. We're not going to listen to God. For thou hast taught them to be captain. And as a chief over thee, shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? Again, that passage usually... Is a kind of reference to the tribulation. We're mighty cat. Look at our armies. Look how great we are. You know what America learned last month or this month? We need to start building ships again. China is out building the Navy. Their Navy is bigger than our Navy. We're in trouble. And it kills me is, all right, we were after men in Babylon. And we were after men in Afghanistan. And with a great, minute military force we had, it took us forever to get uh, bin Laden. It took us forever to get Hussein. Well, where's our mighty men? 
We launched these missiles that, you know, we could see on CNN. You know, these missiles heading right to the building, blowing the building up. But there was nobody there important. And we still got men over in Afghanistan. And our casualties have been very much. By the way, you know when our soldiers go over Afghanistan and those Middle East countries, they cannot bring a Bible? Oh, you're really going to have God on your side. No Bible? Okay. Attention all military personnel, move out. Anybody here who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, now is the time to move. All right, the people left, you don't want the Bible? All right, notify, uh, pick a state ballistic miss missile submarine. Give orders for that submarine to open up 24 tubes and blast that country to pieces. And then we go in there, clean up, and you can bring your Bibles. We don't have to worry about the people that hate God and hate the Bible. They're dead. And then they're in hell burning. They're Bible believers. I mean... Military strength ain't going to get you by in the anger of God. And if thou say in thy heart, <laughs> that's pride. I do what my heart tells me to do. That's the expression today. Wherefore come these things upon me? Why? Why is Babylon here? For the greatness of thy iniquities are thy skirts discovered. Well, what's under your skirt? That girdle. Oh, look at that filthy underwear he's got. Oh, that's gross. There it is. Now, let me tell you what the problem with the church age today. When they don't teach about iniquity, they don't teach about sin. And everybody's a good doober. And you don't need to repent because God's a kind, loving. And then when God removes that skirt, <laughs> men shall not wear what pertains to a woman, a woman not pertains what wears to a man. And when God removes your skirt at the judgment seat of Christ, oh, Pastor, I thought you were better than that. Oh, man, that was our pastor. Oh. Man, will you hurry up and put the fire on? That guy stinks. He's horrible looking. I sat under that guy. That's a deacon? That was somebody's wife? That's the guy that sat in front of me in the pew? Oh! Oh! And then you're going to get somebody who loves the Lord and does right. And you're going to, I, I guarantee, I, I don't know what to add to it. I guarantee the judge well, you know what he did? He went to the store and got himself new underwear before he showed up here. Because nobody can have underwear that clean. So There'll be some kind, yeah, I put it under blood, I confess my sins. And you too can have clean underwear before God. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what's the rest of it? To cleanse us. There is nothing better for cleansing sin the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. And it leaves no stain. You know the you know, they celebrate the worldly birthdays. You know, when I was I was brought into this world, I was born. You know, I had dirty underwear when I was brought into this world. When I was when I was born, September 6, nineteen sixty eight, I think ten something a.m. in the morning. I came out of my mother's womb with underwear from Adam. You say, you did not. You came out naked. No, I came out with underwear from Adam. 
It was stained already with sin. When my mother gave birth to me, after she gave birth to me, there was a thing called afterbirth. And everybody, happy birthday to you. You stinking little poo-poo. All the sin that you will do. And then for me, April 25th, 1987, I knelt down at a coffee table I did not want to go to hell. I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll find this with, one of the, with Joshua. One of the prophets talk about it. And heaven came down. I, 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 I'm spiritualizing this. And I, okay. This did not literally happen. He just came down and said, God, take all that dirty underwear stuff off. Take off all that filthy clothes. Clean them up in the blood of Jesus. He's saved. He's my child now. Give him a new pair of underwear. And I, I walk through life with, with linen and underwear. And when I've sinned, dude, how am I going to get rid of that stain? Lord God, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do it. I plead the blood of Jesus. I, I need victory from you, God. Help me, please. Where'd it go? It was a... God says, come now, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet. Ooh, look at that. That's a big red stain on a white shirt. Oh. They shall be white as snow. How to get clean? By the blood of Jesus Christ. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? No. Nope. Mr. Jackson tried to do it. Or a leopard his spots? Watch out for the leopard type of antichrist. Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Well, look at that. The sins of Judah, they got to a point, you know what? God's saying, I really don't think you, you're going to get right. Though God's not willing, oh, in the farmer's market ministry, you've got, everybody's going to get saved. No. There are going to be some people who have heard it over and over and over and over. And no matter how many years, they're going to die. And they're going to die in their sins. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passes away by the wind of the wilderness. That's the refuge. That's the junk. That's the crap of wheat. This is thy lot, portion, property. The portion of thy measures from me, saith the Lord, because thou hast forgotten me. Talking to Judah, not Jeremiah. And have trusted in falsehood. Oh, that's religion. That's government. That's science. Therefore will I discover thy skirt. You got skirts in that 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 that, that uh, girdle. Upon thy face. Therefore, I discovered the skirts upon thy face. That's not where you wore a skirt. That thy shame may appear. One day, God's is going to drop the clothing. He's going to reveal who you are. One day your pastor will be revealed on who he is, whether righteous or unrighteous. One day you will be revealed before all Christians, whether you're righteous or unrighteous. You will be revealed before your mother and your father, 
before your son or your daughter, before your wife or your husband, before your pastor, before your church, before your boss, if he's saved, and your co-workers, if they're saved, or even, the, I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ, but even the great white throne judgment, all people one day will be revealed on who they really are. The secrets of Donald Trump will come out that you didn't even know. And the Bushes, and the Washingtons, and the Carters, and the Jeffersons, and the Adams. And Therefore will I discover the skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. I have seen thy adulteries, this is God speaking. Americans see their adulteries on the television too. And thy nines or names. Remember that with the horses? The cat call? Evidently, you know, we go. I can't do it. No more. I can't do it with my teeth. Evidently, he, the, 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 the people of Judah had a woman call that sounded like a horse. I can't even try to do it. When they saw a woman, they didn't whistle at it, they made it sound like a horse. The lewdness of thy whoredom and thy abominations on the hills of the fields, that's those high places. And it's funny, though, that the church on the hilltop. And you'll see on albums of Christian now, they'll have a church and it's on a little hill. You don't know what the Bible says, do you? You know where the you know what most churches I've seen? It's interesting. The pews faced east when the sun rising. Some more, Sunday morning sun rising, all the pews, even I know there's a wall, but all the pews are facing the sunrise service. And we'll talk about that, Lord willing, when we get to Ezekiel. How the sunrise service is an abomination. I see that church didn't have it. That church had it. That one didn't have it. That one didn't have it. That one had it. That one had it. That one didn't have it. I'm counting the churches where they, they face towards the east, sunrise. God sees it all. The abomination of the hills and the fields. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem. And America and the churches. Will thou not be made clean when it shall be once? When shall it once be? Won't you just get clean? Won't you do right? And God already said, guess what? They're not going to get right. God is trying with Jeremiah, get right, repent. But God's already told Jeremiah, I'm warning them. But they're not listening. Oh, Lord God, you've given me this ministry. I, I'm trying to evangelize. I'm trying to preach the gospel. But they're not listening. I know. But what did I tell you to do? To preach the gospel. Yes. Are you? Do you save them? No. What did I tell you to do? Well, you told me to plant or water. Okay. Do you save them? No. So you don't save them. No. What did I tell you to do? You told me to preach the gospel, plant the seed, water the seed. Is that what you're doing? Oh, well, yeah, Lord, but they're not listening. They didn't listen with Jeremiah. Now, here's the error. Here's the sin. Churches today say, well, that doesn't work. People don't get saved. People don't come to church. Let's use the worldly ways to get them saved. Let's use the worldly ways to get them in our church. And that's not what God told us to do. Jeremiah stayed faithful. He preached what God told him to preach. 